Hello everybody! Today we will learn something about capacitors. Capacitors are passive electrical components that have the ability to store and release electrical energy. So how is a capacitor constructed? It is mainly simple. Take two electrical conductors, put between them an insulator and that's it, you have a capacitor. Of course, you'll have to pay attention to the surface that the conductors overlap and the distance between them. Therefore, the conductors will have two plates for a bigger overlapping surface. As mentioned before, a capacitor can store and release electrical energy. When a capacitor starts to store electrical energy, it is charging and when releasing it, it is discharging. A capacitor does not allow direct current to it, but alternating current instead. The capacitance is the amount of electrical charge that is stored in the capacitor at voltage of 1 volt and is measured in units of farad. Let's see how a capacitor works. A capacitor is like a water tank. The amount of water in the tank would be the amount of charge in the capacitor. The height of the water would be the voltage to which the battery filled up the capacitor and the area of the tank would be the capacitance. There can be smaller tanks that fill and empty faster than other bigger tanks. Also, capacitors can charge and discharge faster or slower depending on their capacitance. But capacitance is always fixed, it has a tolerance and depending on the capacitor types, the tolerance can vary from 1% to 20%. Also, the value of the capacitance can be affected by changes of temperature around the capacitor because this can make changes in the dielectric properties. Now, let's imagine that we have two capacitors. A 16V capacitor with a 220 microfarad capacitance and a 10 volt capacitor with 470 microfarad capacitance. These capacitors are connected in a circuit and are supplied from a 9 volt battery. If we supply with a 9 volt battery, it will be like that. The top value of the first tank will be 16 volts, so a voltage value higher than that would harm the tank. Depending on the resistance that the flow of water has between the supply tank and other tanks, there is a time in which each tank is filled. In the image, the resistance is given by the thickness of the pipes that the water is flowing through. In a circuit, it will be the resistance that the charges are filling when accumulating on the plates. Intensity of charge flow is slowed down by, guess the name? Resistors or even the resistance of the wires that are flowing through. So, the wider tank is charging slower than the other one because it has more capacitance to fill to reach the same level of voltage. As the water from the tanks cannot rise more than the water in the supply, also the maximum voltage in the capacitors is, when fully charged, the same voltage found on the voltage supply. Therefore, let's see what happens if we supply these same two capacitors with a different voltage level, let's say 12 volts. We can see that both capacitors get charged, one can withstand the 12 volts level, but one has a 10 volts maximum level. The problem is that the supply will push the tank with 10 volts limit to reach the 12 volts level, even if it will break apart the tank. So we can see that one important parameter that we'd have to take in consideration when choosing a capacitor would be the maximum voltage that it can withstand without getting destroyed. Now, charging and discharging of capacitors isn't actually happening so simple. So let's talk about it. First of all, we should talk about a time delay that is also called time constant, which mainly depends upon the reactive components either capacitive or inductive, and it's noted with tau. The electrical charge stored on the plates of the capacitor is equal to capacitance multiplied with voltage. 
charging or storage and discharging or release of a capacitor's energy is never instant but takes a certain amount of time to occur with the time taken for the capacitor to charge or discharge to within a certain percentage of its maximum supply voltage being known as its time constant. The time required for the capacitor to be fully charged is equivalent to about 5 time constants where tau is equal with resistance multiplied with capacitance. This forms the basics of an RC charging circuit where 5 tau can also be thought of as 5 RC. The figure shows a capacitor in series with a resistor forming an RC charging circuit connected across a DC battery supply via a mechanical switch. At time zero, when the switch is first closed, the capacitor gradually charges up through the resistor until the voltage across it reaches the supply voltage of the battery. The capacitor charges up at a rate shown by the graph. The rise in the RC charging curve is much steeper at the beginning because the charging rate is fastest at the start of charge but soon tapers off exponentially as the capacitor takes on additional charge at a slower rate. As the capacitor charges up, the potential difference across its plates begins to increase with the actual time taken for the charge on the capacitor to reach 63% of its maximum possible fully charged voltage. In our curve 0.63 Vs being known as one full time constant. We can see in the next table the values of voltage and current depending on the time constant. Notice that the charging curve for an RC charging circuit is exponential and not linear. This means that in reality the capacitor never reaches 100% fully charged. So for all practical purposes, after 5 time constants it reaches 99.3% charge, so at this point the capacitor is considered to be fully charged. The same situation is applied for the discharging of the capacitor when there is no voltage applied on it anymore and it will continue to supply the circuit for a certain period of time until it's fully discharged. Thank you for staying with us until now, don't forget to subscribe, hit the thumbs up button and go charge your capacitors!